Welcome to the final part of Series 9, everyone. I'm going to apologize that Ryan isn't here with me, but life and some sick kids made that a little bit difficult this week. I'm super excited to tell you that the Strata Kickstarter launch date has been announced, and it is tomorrow. It's Tuesday, October 16th, if you're listening to this later on. You will be able to go onto the Kickstarter, back the source book for this very cool game that we've been discussing. You can keep an eye on our Twitter account for links, or you can go to the publisher site, Rowan Rook and Deckard, for more information. I also want to remind everybody that a catacon is fast approaching, and Ryan and I will be there, along with tons of other awesome people, including Megan Dornbrock from the Modifier podcast and now best-selling author James D'Amato, along with a number of other people that you've heard on this show. Tickets are still available if you want to join us in Dayton, Ohio, November 9th through the 11th, and I'll put a link to the ticket site and to the Catacon website in our show notes. Lastly, a quick reminder that you can join us in creating some characters on Twitter with our Tuesday and Friday character creation prompts, or if you want to have some more in-depth discussion about the process, or you want to hear me freak out about the new edition of L5R that just came out this past week, you can join us over on our Discord server, discord.charactercreationcast.com. With all of that out of the way, please enjoy this episode. back to our discussion episode. Last time we created a group of characters for Spire. This episode, we are going to discuss the character creation process. We are very excited to welcome back Grant Howitt, one of the designers of the game we are talking about, and of the upcoming Kickstarter for Strata, a source book for this game. Grant, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself again for everyone and tell us a little bit about the character you made? Cool. Okay. My name is Grant Howitt. I'm a game designer from, uh, from England. I've designed games such as Honey Heist and One Last Job and Goblin Quest and most most recently Spire. Uh, and my character is Jean-Jacques Drink the Sunrise, who is a Knight of the North Docks. What the Knights were once a noble order of protectors, but now they're a bunch of uh, drunk gangsters. Uh, Jean-Jacques is ex-military and is very keen on making sure that everyone in his party gets out of a fight alive. Awesome. Emilia, can you go ahead and tell us about your character? Yes, I made Claudette, who is a Carrion Priest, a particularly excited about being a Carrion Priest. <laughs> Just super into the whole concept, likes to go door to door, telling people about the good news of Charnel <laughs> and what <laughs> this death god can do for them. And, you know, she's got pamphlets and everything. <laughs> oh, I love your character. Ryan, what about you? I made a bound by the name of Sylvia. She used to be a killer for her lord, who sent her to assassinate various individuals that really did not deserve it. They just irked her lord a little bit. So she got out of that game, and now she wants to use her talents for good. She wants to decide who is going to be the one being killed. So she went ahead and bound the god of assassins, Prospero, <laughs> into her blade and uses that to strike out justice. This is a good group of people. Yeah, we seem like nice like, people. people. Yeah, <laughs> like we'd be really fun to hang out with. <laughs> so we're going to go ahead and dive right into our discussion portion, which we call D20 for your thoughts. D20 for your thoughts? So in this segment, we're going to talk to our guest about your thoughts on character creation and how it feels in the system. First, we usually ask how you got your intro into role-playing games in the first place, but I also want to ask how you ended up designing games. Okay. So my first ever intro into role-playing games, I was it was upstairs in a games workshop before Games Day two, Games Day 2000. I was I was I was, I was, a, I was a, a whippersnapper, be about 13, 12 years old, and I'd never heard of role-playing games before. And some guys, but like we were waiting to get on the bus at 5 a.m. to drive down to uh, to Manchester, and we they were playing a 
a what I now realize is a really daft game of Vampire the Masquerade using Sabbat characters. But what what they were doing I was watching it. They didn't allow me to play because I was too young. But I was watching, and 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 I was like, "Oh my god, you can do anything! Oh, it's like Warhammer, <laughs> but you play one character, and you have different ways of getting past problems. Oh my god!" And it absolutely blew my mind. And then I <laughs> tried to get my much cooler friends to play in high school. It didn't really take. And then, like, I, I, right from the start, I was designing my own games and making my own hacks of stuff because the games weren't doing what I wanted. And then I got into writing uh, game design, I suppose. The biggest thing I did first... Uh, so Chris and I, my co-author on this project, uh, we wrote a game called Zombie LARP in 2006, 2007, uh, which was a LARP about fighting zombies, as you can imagine. It wasn't a very imaginative title. But we we <laughs> uh, we managed to get hold of this old converted sports hall, which was offices and classrooms in our, uh, in our university. And we ran overnight uh, with, like... 45 zombies and teams of six players most of whom died it was very very it was it was a it was a it was a nerf uh, system we used because like we we hadn't really larped before and we didn't intend to do any larping before we wrote a system so we came at it from this really weird angle so there were no calls there was no like hit like very very little in the way of hit points or no battle boarding and that sort of thing so it was very um it, let, it just let you get terrified, basically. It was great fun. And that eventually, we, we really leveled nice. it up to the point where we were running it in an abandoned shopping mall in Reading, which was super cool. Um, <laughs> but then uh, that was that was in university. And since then, we've um, gone through a few jobs each. And then now we are both working for our company, uh, Rowan, Rook and Deckard, writing role-playing games full-time, which is challenging and exciting. Can you go ahead and tell us about your personal process when you are sitting down to create a character in pretty much any role-playing system that you pick? Well, I play basically one character, and actually Jean-Jacques is a definitely a um, a step away from that. So normally I play um, a charismatic frontman who is capable of extreme violence, and that's every character okay. I have in every game. Just very, very nice, <laughs> super smiley. Hi, everyone has a break, and he's breaking arm. Uh, and that's and that's always fun. Um, I admire Steven Seagal's fighting style for that, and nothing else about him. <laughs> but his his insistence on breaking everyone's arm is um, inspirational. <laughs> but I I really like playing face characters, and I think what I try to do is I I try to build relationships between characters. So like one of my favorite things is having blood relations between characters. So like. Quite commonly, if I'm going into a group, I'll play someone's cousin or someone's brother or someone's mum. We had we had like a grandma and grandson combination in the Pathfinder game we ran once, which was fun. And it, I find that it generates really good, easy stories because you're not going to follow some chump into a fight. But if your stupid half brother gets into a fight, you're like, oh, I've got to go save him, and you get dragged into <laughs> trouble, which is great. So, do you tend to pick games then that allow you to do? Because I feel like there aren't a ton of games that let you be both charismatic and kind of brutal well the trick is you you have you have to neglect every other part of the character (laughs) that's fair um (laughs) and like um it's like i definitely a charismatic first brutal second um but i i yeah i i i I don't know i don't play much i i'm kind of an eternal gm uh i I very often end up in an eternal gm role but i think that I'll veer towards more like I really like having the opportunity to lie to people or especially to be lied to. I think that's really fun. And if like if my character can get caught up in stuff, so I'll make quite gullible characters who are really nice. Ooh, yeah. Just just so like and and, and who'll believe anything anyone tells them so I can get caught up in plots. I love some good backstabbing. Nice. Like Yeah. Like solid PvP. It's good stuff. <laughs> Well, I think that depends on the system, but we, we, let's not get into that now. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you think that character creation in this game stacks up with other systems that you've played? And were there things that you specifically wanted it to do? Yeah. Um, so we have a we have a series of tenets uh, laid out for our game design, and one of them is awesome abilities you can't you can't decide between and what we want what we want to do is is when when we have the characters we have quite a limited set of abilities per character but we wanted all of them to be like oh i want this oh i want that one as well i want all of them and so just like to give people these really snacky powers which they really wanted uh, I think one of the like the ways in which it differs from other role playing games is we we don't we're not big on stats in that we don't have any but I get I get mm-hmm. quite bogged down by um, like 
working out what my armor class is, working out what my passive perception is, that sort of thing. I don't like working out derived stats. I find those quite boring. And like, mm. there's certainly a place for them, but it's not the sort of thing which I want to write in my own game. And also, I think it's it's quite a quick character process. Like, there's there's not a, yeah. the choices you make are important, and there's not a great deal of them. It's not like oh, how am I going to assign my ability scores? What feats am I going to take? What path is my rogue going to level up into once I hit three, four, five? It's more what's going to happen tomorrow, what's going to happen immediately, and then we'll answer those questions as we go on. It's, it's also the way I run games. I don't. I don't like planning too much. I like having characters and situations and ideas and then letting that interact organically and holistically with the players rather than like, well, here's what's going to happen today and we know this. I'd much rather talk to the players and say, hey, I haven't planned this. What do you want to do today? And then we yeah. spin off each other and you get a much more exciting game than saying, no, we have to do the plot that I wrote down. I did a relationship map, which just doesn't work for me. <laughs> no. And I, I think character creation in this game, I mean, for people that don't have the book in front of them, each of the classes is like four pages of information and that includes one full page picture. Mm -hmm. So there's certainly like, I I didn't feel like I was lacking in choices of things to do, but Mm. it's very compact. Like there's, you don't have to spend a lot of time flipping Mm -hmm. back and forth, like looking through tables and all that kind of stuff. I think, I think that also like the powers, which we give you, the abilities we give you, we want it to be multi-use, multi-situational and also to give the, and, and like to be quite impactful. So like a lot of them are once possession, frame the scene, once possession, basically surprise the GM. And I like being surprised the GM. I like it when the players do something which I hadn't pictured (laughs) and the, and like we wrote the system to back that up so it's very easy to come up with NPCs on the fly it's very easy to come up with plots on the fly rather than something like so I run a I used to run a weekly game with Dungeons and Dragons up until recently we had it was um, Fantasy Los Angeles and they were all high school students uh, it's basically <laughs> like uh, like like Nancy Drew but um, one of them was a half orc that sort of thing and um, like I re- I really struggled with that because I'd have to try and use the rules. And I'd have to, I'd have to yeah. know how many hit points this orc had and where it was standing in relation to the range. Or it's, oh, I don't, uh, it's, it's late and I, I'm drunk. Come on. <laughs> Close enough. Sure. Yeah, that sounds yeah, good. Sure. Yeah. Just do it. Yeah. That sounds cool. I really admire mm-hmm. 13th Age for that in what they did with... I, 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 I adore 13th Age in the way that it... it it, it assumes the GM isn't planning uh, isn't planning everything, and it also assumes that in terms of distance, you have like engaged, close, nearby, and far away, and those are the mm-hmm. four places you can be, and everything's relative rather than doing it in feet, which I am too old for now. Yeah, mm-hmm. no, that's I don't like to math. I really don't even like adding up <laughs> dice. I don't uh, yeah. like it. I yeah. think I think like basically, I wrote a game which was the diametric opposite of Shadowrun. There you go. That's probably <laughs> in terms of mechanics. Yeah. I'm okay with that. I mean, Shadowrun's a good setting, but that's amazing. yeah, no, that's so many dice. Mm-hmm. I, I I wrote yeah, I wrote I... an article um, four years ago called Ten Things I Hate About Shadowrun," uh, which was a I I got given the fifth edition rulebook as a birthday gift because the guy who got it for me he was like Grant, you're going to hate this, <laughs> enjoy it, and so I got it. And like I read, and that's the thing. Like I learned a lot from Shadowrun. I wouldn't play it, but it was really fascinating reading and getting absorbed in the setting. And there's a lot to love there, but there's also rules for treading water. And it's like, I don't need rules for treading water in a game. Yeah. That's too much. You've gone too far. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I really liked how the character creation in this system is very story centric. Yeah, very much so. Yeah, I I love that every single choice is something that builds upon either your character story or the world story, which is really, really I think there's a balance to be had with that as well. Um, and, like, you could end up, during character creation, like, focusing too much on the past and focusing too much on trying to build the world. Uh, much so, like, mm-hmm. uh, when we wrote Unbound, which is the, game, the big game we released before Spire, all of the uh, character... They were called traits, which was kind of your special, special power you laid on top of your class and your role. Each... Whenever you picked an ability from that, you had to answer a question about the world and about your history. And so they were tailored. And like, so like the, like the fire power had one of the questions, what's the most beautiful thing you've ever destroyed? And that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. And so it helped you build and help you get, like, help you weave a world together as you make the characters, which I think is a really, right. like, one thing which I really think is very important is, is having players involved in the world creation process. Because if they're if they're invested and they're involved, they'll feel much more comfortable making decisions and feel much more comfortable saying, "Oh, I know this guy. I know this PC. I know this NPC. He's done this." Blah 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 blah, and they feel um, happy. They feel engaged and involved. And I had to do no work, and they still think I did work. 
That's the mm-hmm. secret right there. It's just making exactly. people think that you prepped for days. Yeah. That's the trick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so how does the process of character creation then set a player's expectations for playing the system? And how do they add or detract from immersion? Mm. So primarily... When we were writing Spire, initially character classes were called backgrounds, and it was where you were from, what you did before you joined the ministry. And we've sort of we made them a bit more, uh, bit bit more front and centre now, and have the ministry as more like as more of a backdrop thing, which you can choose to go into. We have an extra advance, which have a, we have a variety of spells and abilities around uh, shadows and secrecy and misdirection, and the classes themselves have now grown up and they are all intrinsically linked to somewhere in Spire. So like my knight is of the North Docks and so that means that um, we start talking about the pubs that are in the North Docks we start talking about the culture of the gangsters and the different knightly orders that come together and the, the inversion of traditional fantasy tropes also similarly I, I, I got a rowboat during character creation which um, if we had a GM for this fictional campaign they should put canals in otherwise I can't use my rowboat um, mm-hmm. Similarly, uh, Amelia's character is a carrion priest, and so they had. Uh, so that means that you're signalling you want death and magic and the occult and weird religion to be part of the game, but also they're tied to New Heaven. They're tied to the like the war between the carrion priests, uh, the Charnelites, and the Morticians, and the new blood, the old blood, uh, the towers of silence swarming with hyenas and crows pecking at the bones of people. And you picked uh, Ryan. You picked a bound, and so you're talking mm-hmm. about perch. Uh, the shanty town nailed onto the side of Spy and their own peculiar customs, the way in which they have small gods. And part of the creation process is we got you to name your god and what they were the god of. And now that god exists mm-hmm. in Spy and that god is important in our game, like where that god's yeah. from, where you stole them from, how they feel about being in prison, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you actually had kind of you had kind of an interesting thing because it's it sounded like that you'd bargained with the god to help them act in a, in a certain way rather than being forced into certain ways by their by their uh, worshippers. And so, in addition to being part of the world, when you pick a certain power, you're saying, this is important to me. So, like, uh, we don't have a great deal about ghosts in the book, and one of the carrion priest abilities is you can speak to ghosts by marking a certain amount of stress. Uh, And to make sure that that got you used, it's once per session, you can find a ghost nearby that's relevant to the current situation. And then that just gives you the ability to say, hey, I want ghosts to be in the game. And like similarly, like the Vermissian Sage, that's you saying, "Hey, I want to go to Train Hell. I want to go <laughs> yeah, to the I like, love the yeah Train Hell <laughs> w- Ghost Train. I want to go. Yeah, I want to go to the Nightmare Mass <laughs> Transit Network, which penetrated the vile heart of Spire, and everything went wrong, and they had to shut it down, and no one goes in there anymore. I want that to be a big part of the game. Have you had bad experiences awesome. with public transit? I feel like this came from somewhere. <laughs> I used I used to live in New York. Oh, okay. <laughs> Carry on. <laughs> okay, there you go. That's awesome. Well, I, I, it leads me to another question. If characters were to perish, which this seems like a fairly brutal system mm-hmm. at times, so I would imagine that character death could be pretty plausible, and you bring in a different character type, it sounds like you pick a different class, you're filling in other holes... Mm. Of the ongoing campaign. I should know as well, like, it's a it's a brutal system, but not a necessarily deadly one. It's actually quite hard to die. Like oh, interesting. But you will like you'll go through hell getting there. And if you yeah. die, you're paradoxically quite lucky because you've accrued enough stress to hit hit death on your results without act without triggering that earlier so it resolves as something less less powerful. Uh, but like much more commonly, you'll get knocked out. You'll break an arm. You'll uh, you'll mm. uh, lose a bunch of money. You'll have the secret police start knocking around and burn down your safe house. That sort of thing. So it's more like things get worse and worse and worse and worse. And then if you're lucky, wow. you die. <laughs> Death is a release. Yes. But yeah, certainly there is that like, you can you, you can plug roles, but it's very much one of the things I really liked about Thirteenth Age is when I. Like session zero for us is that we'd make the characters and then I'd start asking questions about the world and how the icons, like the big movers and shakers, related to the world and the characters. And then over that session zero, we'd build this this place to explore together and have all these questions to answer. And I think like when we were going into Spire, we tried to do that. So a great deal of it relies on the GM to look at the characters and look at what they're interested in. in fact in the GM section we have a little box out which is if a player has chosen this particular character class here's the sort of things they're signaling they're interested in and try and weave these into your game 
this is an awkward question to ask the designer of a game, but I'm going to ask mm-hmm. it anyway because mm-hmm. it's fun to ask hard questions. Mm. What do you think is a flaw of this character creation process? And mm. are there any things that you would change? If anything, it's too evocative. Too perfect, some might say. <laughs> um, no. Yeah. Um, I think the I think because we because we, we we wanted to we wanted the classes to tell the story of Spire and to show what Spire is currently like, primarily as a means of, of cluing players into the world without them having to read all the settings. So like for example, Ryan, you've not read the book, but I feel you've got kind mm-hmm. of a handle on what our campaign's gonna be about. And I, I, yeah. I feel like you'd 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 feel okay coming up with details or knowing where to go or guessing where to go. Mm-hmm. We we wanted to communicate that through the classes rather than have people sit down and do reading comprehension. The issue with that is if you end up with a like a masked who is a quiet social character focused around infiltrating high society and a carrion priest who is a lunatic death cultist with a hyena lashed to their wrist it can be quite difficult to smudge them into the same party and like you can end up having to leave the cat like the carrion priest has to sit out or the mask has to sit out and that sort of thing so like there is if everyone plays just what they want it can be difficult to have the game still take over whereas in something like pathfinder or dungeons and dragons everyone's assumed to be at least passably good at doing a fight so you can always have a fight I think that's 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 certainly a um, perhaps uh, not a flaw, but a, a limitation of the system. Yeah, I mean, I feel like that's also on people to like be better groups, man. Like, yeah, compromise a like, little bit, dude. Can I? Yeah, if, <laughs> if I can just if I can just briefly rant about the about the the power divide between GMs and players and the expected <gasps> the work you're expected to do, I get really mm-hmm. cheesed off with this because. Players make whatever characters they want, and the GM might sometimes say, "Oh, you're not allowed from this source book because I have because it isn't balanced, or I'm not ready for it in my campaign, or whatever." But it's it's understood that you can use everything from the core book and make whatever character you want, and then it's up to the GM to somehow smudge these characters together, and then they go off and do mm-hmm. all this prep, and you just turn up and just say, "Oh, I don't know, I hit it with my axe every week." I am Amelia, yeah. and this is my hill to die on. Players, <laughs> players need to show up. <laughs> <laughs> this is, I mean, so this is a big reason why we do our other sh- podcasts, like episodes in between mm. with our player advice, because I feel like it's sort of expected that like the GM does everything and the players just show up and then you eat your pizza and you have a great time. And yeah. like, no, put in some freaking effort. Yeah. Okay. Um, as far as Unbound goes, like the way which Advancement worked in Unbound, you had character they were called fates, and it was things which were going to happen to your character. You picked one, the group picked the other, and the GM was almost black, almost banned from writing any plot. So when you turned up, you just say, hey, what are your fates? And then once you'd resolved both of those, you leveled up and you picked another another two fresh ones. And the idea was that there were always plot hooks ready on the table for you to go, and they were generated by the players. Because, yeah, I'm, I, I'm bored of writing reams and reams of text that no one ever reads. No, and I just think that, like, <laughs> anyway. if... You know, players should have more involvement, too, because you have all this, you know, like, you think of combats, and it's like, okay, I'm just going to sit here and wait for my turn. Mm. And it's like, no, do something with that, and, like, be Mm. slightly invested, and put in the effort so that you feel invested, because that's half the reason that people have problems with people paying attention at their tables, Mm. is because they haven't put in any effort, and they don't care. And I, I think also like it's a systemic problem with looking at a lot of the way that a lot of the way that a lot of games are mechanically designed. There's in in a combat situation when you zoom into that very high detail, high focus, or whether or not I hit or miss with this attack is very important. There's nothing to do when it's not your right. turn. Mm-hmm. And like in most games, there's nothing to do when it isn't your turn. And like games like Spire, like Apocalypse World, we do away with the idea of turns. It's more way to conversation, and you chip in and go and go back and forth. And so like everyone's much more invested. Or something like the popcorn initiative system mm-hmm. from Marvel Super Heroic, I believe, which just after one person acts, that person picks the next person to go. And that just means that no one knows when they're going, and everyone's watching. And quite common, it'll be like, oh, actually, I want this NPC to fight because. A, I have a tactic which involves them running towards me first, or B, I want to see how the fight goes on. I want to see how this. I want to see how this works out. Absolutely. So that's quite neat. But there's like there should be we sh- as designers. I think we should look at things to do. <laughs> people way ways people can me- can mechanically interact with the game when it's not their turn. Absolutely, and just yeah, uh, to, like I said, rant. engagement. Just mm. like pay attention and and 
think about it between sessions do yeah. other things yeah mm-hmm. that's that's my hill to die on too that's fine okay and i am not a gm <laughs> or a game designer i just have played with really crappy people <laughs> mm-hmm. The next question that we have, kind of know the answer to, but uh, since this game is kind of more geared towards a story, Mm -hmm. this one might not make too much sense, but how balanced are the different character types? That's fair. We we have a broad array of things you can do, and a lot of the game is talking to people. A lot of the game is making deals, brokering, um, like brokering promises and that sort of thing, which is a much more fluid interaction and like balance in that way doesn't quite work in the same way it does in combat we've done our best to balance them it's hard to predict every situation that will arise in a game we've we haven't heard any complaints of things being balanced uh of things being unbalanced i have heard that the uh, the carrion priest's prey hook is op that was the first and only comment on our announcement um for, for the strata kickstarter it was like prey hook is op please fix oh, thank you no i don't want to no no that's fine um We've we've done okay, I think, and like part of the way in which we balance games is to limit the number of choices and again make those choices important. And I think once you get to something with the amount of rules that Pathfinder that D and D has, it's so hard to balance that, and you have to put so much work in. And also the people you're working with with teams, you're you're working with players who are expected to optimize and expected to try and fudge the system so it works. You know, so they do their Mm -hmm. thing better. And I think that the way in which we do, like, we've got binary on-off skills and we've got a fairly, like, it's very easy to hit the cap on how many dice you can roll if you're doing your thing. Mm-hmm. We'd much rather just let players do their thing. And, like, when when it's your time to shine, you shine brilliantly. And when it's not your time to shine, you can support and you can help other people out. But we were much more focused on, rather than having everyone's balanced and everyone can sort of chip in, it's more you get a scene and then you get a scene and then you get a scene and we weave those together. I like that kind of as you move forward to it feels like like you don't necessarily always get better at things but you definitely get cooler at them yes that's a that's a fair design <laughs> um goal which we yeah you get cooler um you get better you, you certainly you broaden your abilities yes and you have more tricks up your sleeve and you can do and like you can bend reality over your knee in more and more interesting ways. Yeah, I think that because because there aren't, you know, like you're not adding modifiers or points to things. So it doesn't no. always feel like you are like getting, you know, like the numbers aren't going up. But mm. the new, you know, advances and things that you can pick are just like really yeah. cool. We want to give people new toys to play with. Uh, like so like one of our one of our not design tenants for the game, but one of our tenants for our business, Rowan, Rick and Decker. We've got six tenants. I forget what most of them are. Oh no, they're written on my wall up here. Um, <laughs> one of our values is no dead levels. And one of the things which always bothered me in three point five is you just have some dead levels where like, oh, you get to mm-hmm. add a couple you get to add like one to your saves and then you nothing else and just wait until your next level when your sneak attack goes up. And it's like, come on. Oh, I yeah. got a level. The paladin can summon a horse now, and that and like we did like every like we wanted every choice to be meaningful, everything to excite the players. You know, we we didn't yeah. want any sort of boring admin phase. Oh yeah, or you like level mm-hmm. up and you take a skill that has nothing to do with anything that you've been doing. Like all of a sudden, I know yeah. sailing, and it's like you haven't even seen the ocean. Like, why do you yeah. have this skill? That frustrates me. Yeah, I've although opinions. you know opinions find a boat right well maybe that's yeah maybe that's <laughs> you, what that you, means. You, you've downloaded the skill from the matrix yes yeah. <laughs> hey look a boat <laughs> i think i might be able to pilot i that. know how to tie knots show me <laughs> <laughs> one thing that always interests me is from a gming standpoint is how hmm. Do you create NPCs? Because there are some games where you are expected to just create a full new character, and that is a pain. Uh, jog on. <laughs> exactly. No, I've no mm-hmm. time for that. Mm-hmm. Um, now, I'm very much in the idea that NPCs should not use the same rules as PCs. It doesn't mm-hmm. like it. It leads to balance issues, and it leads to some kind of. Sh- it means that if NPCs and PCs are using different rules, then you end up with a lot more GM fudging and a lot more smoothing. But I think we're all grown ups, and we can handle GMs taking the reins once. You know, we're, we're, as long as we all treat each other with honesty and kindness, then that's fine. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Our NPCs they have three stats, I think. Yeah. Two actually they have two stats. They have resistance, which um, so all of our resistances, blood and silver and reputation. Instead of having all of those, they have one flat number which you have to erode, and then when it's eroded by inflicting stress, they're at your mercy. 
And you can do that through social maneuvering, you can do that through combat, it's generally the most common. They have difficulty, which is the number of dice subtracted from your pool when you act against them. And that can be like, so like certain ones can be like, it's difficulty two when you catch them on the first night of the Red Harvest Moon, but difficulty one otherwise when they're not on their transformed form. Um, and then they Ooh. have some equipment, and we, we don't have an equipment table, we make up every bit of equipment we do generally because they like nice. we just we we have it so it fits the character and then we have a a stress the dice which uh, shows how much damage you do and then a few tags to modify that in certain ways but it's very easy to just come up with npcs on the fly and understand what the what what, what the rules would be i like the idea that they're that their resistances aren't set out to, because I feel like as a GM, you don't necessarily know what approach your players are going to take with any given mm. character that they run into. And so, mm-hmm. you know, if you have a character that only has one sort of resistance and then they choose something else, you're in trouble. Yeah, for sure. Uh, we also encourage people to name all their NPCs. We have three suggestions for every MP- th- three name suggestions for every for every NPC block, and also three descriptors, uh, which we encourage people to pick from. But I found that like I get. I find it very hard to engage with a fight, which is there's three orcs. Yeah. What they're like, oh, mm-hmm. they're orc shapes. Uh, but like, if you've got all oh, this one orc who has like this, this matted red hair and one orc who has milky blind eyes and is breathing in, in and out ghosts and one orc who has two long wicked <laughs> knives, then there's knife guy, hair guy and ghost guy. And they don't need names per se because you can identify them in some way and then you can start like mm-hmm. in, in the fiction, whereas where just mechanically you're just rolling to hit with the orc scimitar, he's grabbing the face of someone and just huffing a load of old ghosts in there and draining their levels and draining their hit points, you know. I think that reskinning enemies is a GM, a required GM skill. I like the idea of breathing ghosts. It's pretty cool. I'm really yeah. stuck on that. That's that good. Pretty cool. I want to be able to do that. That's a good. <laughs> it's a good quality uh, feat. Maybe, maybe that's how your character summons ghosts. Maybe. Mm. That's the thing. Like, I, I mean, like, like legit. <laughs> like considering how um, rulesy Spire is, you, like on your character sheet, you've got War Cleaver D6. Mm-hmm. You could just have. Ghosts D six, um, summoning ghosts to attack is is as illegal, if not more illegal, than a war cleaver. So um, wow. go, you know that's fine. You can, you can breathe ghosts now. Yeah, I mean I gotta do. <laughs> well, if you're eating people, probably their ghosts are inside you, right? Probably yeah. I don't know how that ghosts make, work on see, your digestive system. You're making system. a lot of sense. That's just logic. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. The human body cannot d- digest ghosts. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, they gotta come out somewhere. Might as well come out your mouth. Oh my. Okay, so let's go ahead and get into one of my favorite questions. Just talking about the group's cohesion. How does our current group gel within the system uh, kind of mechanically? And how would we fare in a typical session in this system? It gels pretty solidly, honestly. Like, we've all got the low society domain, Mm -hmm. um, which means that we are all going to always roll the next d 10 whenever we interact with low society and we're all going to find it hard to survive when we're talking to posh people or let's say when we're trying to navigate the technological depths of the Vermissian or deal with the occult even none of us have the occult skill um so like there's there's definitely mysteries out there in places which we can't go to and act as effectively but there's there's certainly our uh, what's the word our ballywick bailiwick wheelhouse our wheelhouse is certainly low society and so like I can certainly see us um, all hanging out in bars and going and like causing trouble in Red Row. And um, like my knight character, who has a lot, who has like a, a buff on people, so so they ignore mine, a fallout, and just so much armor and blood resistance is ridiculous. So like him getting into a fight and the Carrion Priest defining things about the fight that we we can tag later on, and the bound just. <laughs> appearing in the rafters above and just dropping on someone <laughs> and shanking them. Like, I, I can see fights happening quite nicely and also like nice. have them happen when someone spills my drink. It's like, oh, okay, this is happening. Let's go. <laughs> yeah, I like the idea that we are all fairly death-focused in our own way. Um, so getting mm-hmm. into trouble yeah. seems pretty easy. Yeah, for sure. Mm-hmm. And I like, I'm, and as, as far as like, I didn't, I don't, honestly, like, I, I feel like my character is the least explored or like perhaps the most basic out of the ones which we which we generated and i think that's because i'm primarily a gm and so i'm not used to making a character for a pc group but i'd be really interested in working out like what his what his limits are and what is it's like well who am i saving and why am i saving them and what am i prepared to do for that 
and like mm-hmm. who am I counting as my unit in that way? So like you guys are my unit, I'll look after you. But is this person do they fit in? Am I prepared to sacrifice them? Uh, in terms of faring, well, I think we do all right. We are we are hell on wheels when we want to throw down. We can't really mm-hmm. talk to people super well, mm-hmm. um, so we might have to rely on intimidation. I'm, I think I'd probably be the party face man, uh, given that I have the compel ability. But we'd be looking at I have trying to. Too. Oh, you got compelled. Brilliant. Yeah, I mean, as long as we're talking about my pamphlets, we're fine. (laughs) (laughs) I can see us basically trying to collect blackmail information on people or trying to like trying to threaten them or get them into difficult situations and then earning them as an, as, as an unwilling bond who we then send off against other people to try and rectify situations. (laughs) I feel like this situation is good cop, bad cop, but it's just like bad cop, worse cop. Yeah. Like, we're right. not cop. good at... Worst cop. Yeah, we're not good at this. cop. <laughs> yes, a murder cop. <laughs> murder cop. <laughs> good cop, bad I cop. I like knives. <laughs> <laughs> so can I kill them now? Can I kill them now? Just a minute. Do not make me turn this car around. <laughs> I want to talk about the system as a whole and how it plays and how it lends to character development. Not necessarily, like, advancement, but... Do you feel like characters have the ability to grow and change as people over the course of gameplay as story happens? Yeah, for sure. Um, I think that that's not relate. That's not related so much through the character advancement rules, which are more mechanical in, in play. But actually, the fallout is what pushes a great deal of advancement in that. So if when you pick up problems, not so much in terms of like, I've got a broken arm because you just kind of wait until that heals. I'll go find someone who can heal it with magic. But one of our fallouts is um, obsessed. Uh, And so you become, your mind becomes fractured and razor sharp around a single idea. And that means that you are, you roll with mastery. So you get extra dice whenever you try to do that thing and a negative dice whenever you do anything which isn't that thing. And then when you do the thing, you are forcibly retired. But it gives you a hell of an arc because, like, something's broken you and you become the single-minded lunatic. And things like, uh, it's possible to to accrue debt. And rather than saying, oh, you have X amount of pounds in debt, which you have to pay back. It's just, no, you are in debt. And you've agreed to do a favor to some people who you wouldn't rather work out with the GM who they are and what the favor is. And so from that, like, basically from acting and from messing up a little bit, you get fallout. And then that fallout pushes other story forward. And then you get more problems, blah, 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 blah. And eventually you maybe get to die. And the, the fallouts are based on the resistances, right? So, like, they're yeah, different sure. flavors based on... You know, like what kind of quote unquote damage you are taking. Um, Mm -hmm. And I feel like they're Mm -hmm. super flavorful. Like there are things that I I mean to my characters and like I'm totally okay with bad things (laughs) happening to them. (laughs) And there are some in there that I'm like, oh, this is really cool. I hope that happens. Yeah, yeah, for sure. We had like um, one of my one of my favorite ones. We had, and I, I don't want to talk too long about something which happened in my game, but because uh, you weren't there and neither were the listeners. But the first character death we had in Spire, the we don't have a dead fallout. We have dying, and when you're dying, you can choose to cling onto life and lose something important, or do one thing really well, then die. And oh. it was, and like this, this, this moon priestess has got had gotten gut shot, and was, and was, was uh, she, she decided to lunge off a balcony to save the knight from from a guy who was sneaking up behind her with a knife. Uh, completely botched the role and just tumbled from the balcony and broke her neck. Like not even the camera wasn't even in focus on her, and it was so powerful <laughs> to have that. I'm going to do this one last nope. And like we all, like we all burst out laughing, and then we were like, "Oh god, that's really dark. <laughs> oh, no. oh, that's horrible. That poor, that poor woman." It's funny because I could tell exactly which one Ryan and I would pick. Like Ryan would pick <laughs> to do one last big heroic thing, and mm. I would be like, "Nope. Like let's lose mm-hmm. something really important and just be sad." I think I think you'd be the first person. Everyone always picks <laughs> to do one last heroic thing. Oh my god, but, no. Like, like, no, no, for sure. I mean, that's, that's why we put it in there. Like, Honestly, it's a more interesting story if you goof up. Oh, yeah, because then like, you, you're sad about it. And like, great. Yeah. So like, now there's this horrible consequence for... Yeah. Like, and, and also, you don't have to make a new character. Right. Which is like, that well, saves everyone I thought. I like making characters, clearly. Yeah, well, clearly, but, yeah. <laughs> but I also just like having to suffer the consequences of things. Mm-hmm. That's always really I think there to is me. there is an inherent masochism at play in role play. Like every it's this really weird relationship where you are playing a character and that character is, for the want of a better word, you. 
in they, they are they are the diving bell with which you explore the world of the diving suit from imaginary worlds and you don't want them to have an easy life you want them to get you want them to get their hair pulled you want them to get spat on and pushed down into the mud and have problems and simultaneously you want them to do well and it, and it's like you're saying <laughs> to the gym hurt me right yes <laughs> and it's really it's a, it's a really weird like space to be in so it's fun to it's fun to write rules which mm-hmm. like reward you getting into trouble and that gives you more story and it's not a nice story but it gives you it there's also something for me in it like when there are games where bad things sort of have to happen to you because i Mm. most of my role playing has been with people who are hardcore power gamers and get really upset about failing roles and like build their characters so they can't possibly fail (laughs) roles and like it's like this is so boring like (laughs) great we all won again like (laughs) good job Put a sticker mm-hmm. on your sticker chart. I'm like, no, I yeah. want bad things to happen. I want everyone to feel feelings. <laughs> so with all of those just really great points <laughs> out of the way, we're going to talk about character advancement in our discussion okay. that we call Take It Up a Level. Take it up a level. Take it up a level. All right. And in this segment, we will cover how character advancement or leveling up is covered in this system. So, Grant... How does a character level up Inspire, and what sort of perks are we looking at when that happens? So, the way you level up Inspire, and we have a playtester by the name of Lisa Trott to thank for this. Um, She came up with the idea, and it's inspired. It's saved us so much effort. It's brilliant, and we thanked her in the book. She's an absolute genius for this. But the way it works, um, when you change the city, you level up. Oh, It's for for good or ill. But if you make a minor change, you get a low advance. Medium, you get medium. And for huge, irrevocable, massive changes, you get a high advance. And that's how you level up. So, as I was saying in a previous episode, we want people to make the version of Spire their own. The players are going to forcibly change Spire. If you ran it entirely out of the book, as canon is written, I don't do that. By the end of a successful campaign, it won't be that game. It will have changed. And so... That's the that's the core idea, and so like players generally aim for positive advances. Like j- players aim for positive change, but if you if you happen to burn down the orphanage on accident, you still get the advance. You still change spire. Yeah. Stuff has still happened, and so in a way, we're rewarding players for engaging with the fiction and manipulating it through their abilities, mm-hmm. rather than say um, like. For a while, we had when the GM decides you get the thing, which is obviously I think is everyone's playtest uh, stopgap. But I'm really happy that we that we managed to work this out because it just it just lends a slightly different tone to games. Uh, it also means that what like once you make that big high advance, you get your character, you get that you get that advance, which is your high advance, and they all tend to be not quite a capstone, but it's like the start of your character's last act in this in the story and so like the high level advances you've got things like um you can turn into a patch of moonlight or you can buy a minute of time you can like you, you can rewind time by sacrificing a load of money but like oh, the, i think my favorite one is the we have i'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna explain this joke before i tell it so it won't be funny but we have we have a private <laughs> investigator extra advance you so gray manor investigators are noir pis and all of their abilities focus around like you, you gain information when you lose fights and like just just like a pi like a noir pi going out and getting beaten up and hitting the streets until people make a mistake but the uh, the trinity of drow goddesses is called domnu and their high level advance is called a domnu walked into my office and when you take when you take it, the 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 high goddess of all drow walks in and gives you one last job. <laughs> and like so and like and like it's it's a like mechanically it's a terrible high level advance to take <laughs> because it doesn't grant you any powers whatsoever. I don't seem to remember, but it's just like, hey, I want one last job and I want it to be from God. Yeah, can I have that, please? Again, just communicating to the to the GM. But yeah, um, those are the high level advances in terms of the uh, advances in general. Almost every character in Spire is a cleric, some sort of religious spellcaster. Both are, uh, both of your characters are religious spellcasters. The knight is the most mundane, and then as as I mentioned in the previous episode, their high level advances bring them into mystical abilities. But let's say, for example, the firebrand, who we didn't really touch on, they're a revolutionary leader. Their low and medium advances are all pretty basic, like about getting out of trouble or using trouble to your advantage. To your advantage. And then all of the high level advances, you have enough of a following that you become worshipped as a small god. 
and you can do things like this one that's called uh, the uh, the means of destruction and so you can go around and bless work tools so they function like uh, they, they, they do like the most damage possible if you use them against cops and that sort of thing and so like you have you ha- like we we wanted to play with the idea of religion as power spire is heavily inspired by cyberpunk and we like the word we use is fantasy punk but i think magic punk is a better term in that we want to like look at magic as power and how religion has taken this power and like cut it down and made it clean and made it safe and so like we have occult magic and uh, divine magic are different methods of casting spells and occult magic is much riskier but you might get it free and divine magic has this set cost you pay every time you do the thing and so we basically took the idea of cyberware and technology and hacking and intrusion and then just put a wizard hat on it and made it spire (laughs) I feel like the more you talk about this, the more I'm like, oh, this makes so much more sense about why I really like this game. Like, I'm like, good. oh, yeah, that fits. Yep. Like, oh, I funny. love a good cyberpunk mm-hmm. game. I'm like this, oh, huh, yeah, all right. <laughs> I, 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 th- I think as well, like, um, one of the problems I have with prefix punk as, as of, of any genre is that what it means is historically inaccurate. So steampunk is so rarely punk. And there's so many interesting stories to be told about injustice. And like if you look at the Industrial Revolution, if you look at the Victorian era, like the the ways in which people were using technology and using the power of steam to rise in power and the way in which our our government in the UK was taking over the world with our with, with, with our industry and our navy, and the power they had. It's this is it's huge, fascinating discussions about inequality and colonialism, and what you end up with is someone with a waxed moustache with a galvanic arc rifle. <laughs> ah, yeah, I that's... have an armored petticoat. All right, cool. Yeah, great. Tea? No, yeah, I don't I, want any more I really tea. want the ability to play into my anarchist tendencies, mm-hmm, sure. and I feel like I don't ever get enough of that in those kinds of games. Mm. Like, it's, yeah, it ends up being all about whatever the technology is yeah. of that setting, as opposed to whatever the technology like, is. The power struggle. And also, you play the people on top. You play the colonizers mm-hmm. in Steampunk. You don't play the abused. Yeah, it's true. Um, and, like, every time I see punk, it's just an excuse. And, like, so, so like, cyberpunk, it's about corporations being so big that you can't understand them, that they're alien. If you look at the original source work, mm-hmm. if you look at Neuromancer, these corporations and this, this this level of technology and money, these people have conquered death and you have this like this small time hustler who's brought up into it and sort of briefly touches against that world and it's fascinating. And then most cyberpunk games are just like, oh, I want to have a gun with two barrels that can shoot lasers. Oh, okay, but what about fighting the man? I don't know, I'm going to work for the man until he betrays me and then work for a different man. <laughs> yeah. Yep. As someone who spent a decent amount of high school being punk, mm. it bothers me. <laughs> then I had children, and then I'm uncool now. Well, you could be... But, yeah, you, I don't think you can be a punk mom and be cool. I think you have to... Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I yelled at my kid in a Target, I used to be so punk rock. <laughs> <laughs> That's what my life is now. That's the main reason I'm not having kids, so I don't have to yell at them in a Target. <laughs> Right, yep. Yeah. And so you don't have to stop being punk rock. Yeah, I'm hella punk rock. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying. Petulant acts of anarchy. Yeah. Do you feel like it's beneficial at all in the system to have character advancement in mind ahead of time when you're building your character? Like, there aren't really prerequisites. No. I mean, is it just kind of a thing that you, like, see what you feel like? Generally, what, what we're aiming is, is you want to make a, a dynamic and reactive character. Uh, and so, like again, like I mentioned, that's the way we write our adventures. So we want to make characters who could support that and live up to that. And so it's like, oh, actually, we need to solve this problem. So I can just, you know, buy into this class. I, I can buy into these abilities. I think it's maybe useful to have a think about what high-level ability you'd like to work towards. And that can give you kind of an arc for your character, like a goal to like, oh, I'm, I'm, wo- I'm interested in working towards this one thing. I'm interested mm-hmm. in embracing this particular aspect of the character. But it's not like you don't have to plan out 20 levels. Chris loves planning out 20 levels. I want to say that he absolutely adores it. And like it's like it's made him kind of sad that D- that D&D 5th ed is not quite so easy to uh, min max and mm-hmm. completely ruin with rules because like when when we when we met it was the heyday of 3.5 and he was on all he was on all the forums, he was on all the optimization boards, he had all of his wizards and his druids like built up to to do the thing. Sorry, never wizards. If you want to play a wizard, you just play the wizard build of Druid. I remember now. Um, <laughs> and it's, uh, like, that's not my bag at all. And, like, I I 
get it. I understand why it's fun because there's a mastery there and there's something fun about there's this system. How can I master the system? How can I affect the world? But that ain't my cup of tea, certainly. Mm-hmm. So you can go at it blind. Yeah, I, I like, like I said before, trying to be able to pick things narratively mm-hmm. so that it matches up with what you've mm-hmm. done yeah, or sure. like who you want to be as a person rather than like, I swing my sword harder now. <laughs> like, <laughs> great. Good for you. Can we briefly talk about plus one swords and how rubbish they are? <laughs> yes, we can. It's got, they're, it's they're like, terrible. It's like, it's a magic sword. It's so, like, and like, it comes obviously from having like, a magic sword is just a very well-made sword and using technology which people didn't understand, so it must be magic. Cool. Okay, I get it. That makes sense. But this is a plus one sword. Well, it's plus one swordness. Is it, is it especially sharp? Is it accurate? Is it light? Is it dangerous? It's just more like swords than the other one. You know what? Sorry, I'm making it too interesting. It's not like there's a platonic ideal of sword. And it's the swordiest sword that ever sworded. Presu- p- presumably, like there is a pure ideal of sword, and all swords are merely shadows on the wall of the cave cast by that sword which, which and, and like a slightly clearer shadow is when you get plus one, plus two, plus three. I thought it just but gave no, you I more think... swords. <laughs> Plus one sword, you have a second sword. A very now. low damaging sword. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very little sword, but I it's, hit you it's with more accurate. Two swords. Whoa. Plus one sword. My weakness. Is it but is it like your one sword is now two swords? Mm-hmm. Is this like when my children break crayons and I'm like, look, now you have two mm-hmm. crayons. Yeah, so plus three swords, like you're hitting somebody with four swords at one time. Yeah. But they're just like a quarter of the size of the first sword. No, no, it's mm. all full size. Mm, no. you, think, you think that that would quadruple the damage? You're only adding three damage. It's awkward. So, so you've got a sword, and then like little keyring swords you've stuck on the bottom. Yeah. Oh, like ow, baby swords. Ow, baby sword. Yeah, yeah. Like little little hovering baby swords, like <laughs> own stones hovering around, and they That's zip in like mosquitoes. That's why it's magic because it's got yeah, hovering baby swords. Yeah, we H- hummingbird it. swords that hover around your great axe. <laughs> like, so that's better than a plus one sword. Have that. There you go. Yeah. That one's free. Oh, like a hummingbird that is a sword, so like its just nose is real sharp. Yeah, for sure, and maybe big. Yeah. <laughs> like everything we've come up with here is way better than. <laughs> yeah, t- take that. Years of design. Take that, Gary Gygax in the seventies. <laughs> yeah. Well, that is our episode. Yeah. We have talked about everything. <laughs> is there any? Do you have any last words? Um. No, it's just half past half past three in the morning. I'm going to go to bed. <laughs> yes. Well, <laughs> thank you for staying up late for us. No worries. It's been it's been a tremendous amount of fun. It's been really lovely to talk about the game and to sort of relax into a fairly long and in depth chat about stuff because I don't analyze my work when I'm doing it. So it's kind of fun to go back and be like, oh, that's what I did. Oh, all right, cool. Yeah, yeah, you're right. <laughs> I am brilliant. Yeah, well done, me. <laughs> That's you know we said that we we had Alex Roberts on our show talking mm. about her Starcross game too, and she was like, oh, "You guys just make me so feel so good about <laughs> yeah. myself." And I was like, "Yeah, let's come feel good." Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you for joining us. We really appreciate it. No worries. It's been great to be here. Yeah, Grant. Can you go ahead and remind everyone where they can find you and what sort of things you're working on? Yes, you can find me at G.S. Howitt on Twitter, G-S-H-O-W-I-T-T. You can also go to rowanrookanddeckard.com um, or just search Grant Howitt RPG and just go from there. At the moment, I'm working on Strata, a Kickstarter for which expands Spire and has all sorts of cool adventures and rules and setting information and full details on blinding parties, which is something that high elves do. So that's fun. They, they, they get a piece of art so beautiful that they have to look at it once and then burn the art and blind themselves. Please. That is so extra. It's so extra, right? And yeah, so please come and back us and check out the Kickstarter. You can all, And also Chris, my co-author, you can follow him at, at the Madigan uh, on Twitter as well. He is, he's a lovely chap and he deserves more followers. And I think that's me. Well, thank you so much for sitting down with us and thank you to everyone else for listening. Character Creation Cast is a production of the One Shot Podcast Network and can be found online at www.charactercreationcast.com. Head to the website to get more information on our hosts and guests, or even find some of our character sheets. Character Creation Cast can be found on Twitter at CreationCast. I'm one of your hosts, Amelia Antrim, and I can be found on Twitter at Ginger Reckoning. Our other host, Ryan Bolter, can be found on Twitter at Lord Neptune. Music for this episode is used with a Creative Commons license or with permission from the podcast it originated from. 
further information can be found within the show notes. Our main theme music is Hero Remix by Steve Combs and is used with a Creative Commons license. This podcast is owned by us under Creative Commons. This episode was edited by Amelia Antrim. Further information for the game system used and today's guests can also be found in the show notes. If you like the game systems discussed and wish to purchase them, links to the products can be found in the show notes. Also check our notes or the website for cool stuff to go with each character, like dice or mixtapes. Thanks for joining us. And remember, we find that the best part of any role-playing game is character creation. So go out there and create some amazing people. We'll see you next time. A spider horse... Horse... <laughs> horse book. It's a horse book. <laughs> I'm, I'm bummed that he isn't here because... I learned that he is six foot eight. He's so uh, big. And our last episode, we had someone who was six foot six and continually oh. referenced the fact that he was six foot six. Yeah. So I was really hoping we could have somebody that was six foot eight just to like yeah, do yeah, that yeah. and like continually set a higher bar. But the person never mentions it even. I know. Yeah. That's how I know because I just <laughs> never heard it. You can just hear it in his voice. <laughs> he sounds tall. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. How many ends are there in penance? I'm trying to describe my rowboat. P- like penant, P- like a like a banner. Like two, right? No. N- 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 P e n n a n t. Three. Okay, cool. Yeah, we're fine. <laughs> I mean, don't ask me to spell things, but ah, well, it's fine. As long as I can get out the podcast for, for, for when you upload the sheet and we all spelt it wrong, that's fine. Oh yeah, that's fine. We'll spell. We'll spell check everything. <laughs> We won't really. We'll, just, we'll send it to our editors first. <laughs> now we gotta read some show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Character Creation Cast is hosted by the One Shot Podcast Network. If you enjoyed our show, please visit oneshotpodcast.com, where you'll find other great shows like Modifier. Modifier is an interview show hosted by Megan Dornbrock all about why and how people change games. From the hobbyist to the professional, from house rules to publication, we all have in mind a better way to play. What's yours?